Welcome to 2021 Construction Apprenticeship Fair. I'm Cheryl Valenta with Kirkwood Workplace Learning Connection. And this is the eighth year that we've partnered with the Cedar Rapids and Iowa City Building Trades Council to host this career fair. The first time we've done it virtually. So this will be exciting and new experience. A huge thanks to the Skilled Trades Planning Committee for recording videos and being flexible throughout the year to develop virtual job shadows. We're super fortunate this morning to have 11 different skilled trades professionals on the webinar today to help answer your questions. So feel free to type in your questions at the bottom of your screen in the Q&A section. And as we go along, we will be answering those questions for you. Our first speaker is Mike Carson. He's the training director of IBEW NECA Electrical Apprenticeship Training Center, and he will provide an overview of the common steps it takes to get into the construction industry as an apprentice. Hey, good morning, everyone. So yeah, like Cheryl said, uh, typically we do this in person and we have anywhere from 800 to 1,000 students uh, come through in a couple of days. And then uh, we do a lot of talking and a 10 minute burst to tell everybody about what we do in our specific uh, trade. So thanks for uh, plugging in and uh, looking into the opportunities and uh, what we think is a rewarding uh, career opportunity. Uh, you were sent some links like uh, Cheryl had said uh, for some videos and also uh, you should have uh, look, had a flyer from uh, ICANN. Um, I'm gonna talk a couple, little bit about some statistics in there as well. Um, but anyway, like Cheryl said, there's uh, in our area about 12 different building trades. Uh, there's a couple other ones that uh, uh, maybe are a little less represented in Eastern Iowa, but they do exist. Uh, but anyway, we're gonna talk to you a little bit today about what we do specifically in our trade. Uh, we are in the construction industry. Um, these are apprenticeship programs so that they, they are earned while you learn. So if you off, are offered, an apprenticeship position with one of these trades, you go to work immediately for one of the contractors that represent these trades. Uh, you start earning a paycheck from day one, and then they'll also plug you into the uh, related classroom and lab instructional training that goes along with that. Uh, each of us has a little bit different way that we uh, uh, set up our programs. Some of us are three-year programs, some are five years. It just depends on if the schooling is, um, you know, a full week at a time for several weeks throughout the year, or if it's uh, one night a week or one day a week for a normal school year, uh, some go to night school. So that part of it differs a little bit. You can find out more about that by directly contacting uh, any of the other training directors in those specific trades. But, um, you know, Cheryl said that I represent IBW and NECA. So uh, that's the two part of each of our programs. IBW is International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And then the uh, management side of that is the National Electrical Contractors Association. So each of these building trades is set up similar to that. We have a multitude of contractors that we work for. And then uh, we train people for this industry, specific industry. And uh, you have a great career when you're done. Uh, qualifications for each of our programs are a little bit different, but I think for most of us, you know, for sure you have to be a minimum of 18 years old. Um, some of us will have to take uh, maybe a qualification exam to get an interview, maybe over math, reading and comprehension, things of that nature, just to make sure you have the skills you need to be able to successfully uh, function in the classroom portion of it. And a valid driver's license is really important as well, because typically the first thing you do when you get sent to a job site is put in a, get put in a pickup truck and you're delivering materials, picking up tools, uh, things of that nature. So having a good clean driving record is important. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, while you're in high school. Uh, a couple of statistics I wanted to point out from that ICANN uh, brochure. You know, on page seven, I believe it was, it said that um, the average annual salary of a registered apprenticeship program graduate is $60,000. So that would be if you took all the different wage rates of all these different trades represented today, uh, in a given year would be a minimum of $60,000. Uh, so it really depends on, on what trade. It's more than that now because everybody's getting an annual pay raise currently between May and June. 
And um, that's another benefit of union building trades is what we call a collective bargaining agreement. So, you know, we uh, bargain for our contracts every year, every couple of years and, and have great wages and benefits. And then the contractors expect us to have the knowledge and skills and ability to work hard every day and, and build stuff for them and tear it down and modify stuff. And uh, so that's why we enjoy what we do. We work with our hands and it takes a lot of head knowledge as well uh, in these skilled trades. So I just did, a, uh, I put the calculator on last night right before I, I logged off and ran some figures for you just to give you an idea. So in the, in the uh, if you went to Iowa or Iowa State for four years, it's about $22,000 a year. That's full room and board, tuition, fees, books, all that good stuff. Uh, so you've got some debt by the time you're done, depending on if you had student loans or you know if you had some money in the bank saved, uh, but nonetheless, uh, you're doing a lot of schooling without earning wages unless you're working at the pizza shop or something part-time for some spending money. So in a building trades apprenticeship, um, let's say for our five-year apprenticeship program, in the five years you would work as an apprentice uh, in wages only, you will, you will have earned over $196,000 as an apprentice. You will have earned $44,000 in a pension plan. Um, so you know, that five years, you've earned over $240,000 going to school, earning a trade, and having a career when you're done with no student debt. Um, so right now, a, a journeyman wireman electrician uh, is going to average about $75,000 a year in wages, uh, $16,000 in pension, and about $14,000 for their health, health and welfare program. So over $105,000 a year. Uh, with no student debt for journeyman wireman. Each of the building trades, keep in mind, that's just a, a, a journeyman in that specific trade. But if you're a foreman or a general foreman or a project manager or an estimator, um, you're going to earn a lot more money than that. It really just depends on uh, you know, your work ethic and your desire to uh, you know, reach higher than what's just a basic level after earning a, a journeyman uh, a certificate. And the other good thing is you can use these uh, anywhere in the country. Um, so you can work in Cedar Rapids, Iowa City area, East Coast, West Coast, Hawaii, it doesn't matter as long as you've got that union ticket that says you're an electrician, carpenter, sheet metal worker, plumber, pipe fitter, bricklayer, iron worker. I'm looking at everybody labors, you know, <laughs> it's on the screen here today and you'll see them as they start to talk to you. But uh, Anyway, I just kind of give you a lot of information there because uh, we wanted to give you some background information so you can ask uh, some trade specific questions to all these different folks uh, represented here today. So again, uh, thanks for being present. Thanks, Mike. Uh, appreciate that opening uh, comment. And I think now we'll just take a couple minutes to have everyone kind of introduce themselves and what trade they're with. Um, I think that would be helpful for the students to see you all. So Chris, if you want to get us started. Sure. Um, I'm Chris Bush. I'm with the Bricklayers and Craftworkers uh, and our training center. Uh, John, you're muted. Hi, I'm John Delaney and I work at the Carpenters Training Apprenticeship uh, in Cedar Rapids. Glad to be here today and answer any questions you might have. Thanks, John. Uh, Seth. Hi, my name is Seth Gorman. I'm with the uh, Iron Workers, I'm apprenticeship coordinator there. I'm looking forward to talking to you kids today. Thanks, Seth. Uh, Joey. <clears throat> I'm Joey Papura. I'm from the Labors. I'm the apprenticeship coordinator and the instructor over here at Labors Local 43 in Cedar Rapids. Daniel? Good morning. My name is Daniel Bark. I'm with DF Bark Consulting. I am the full time recruiter for the Millwrights, and I'm an honor to be here today. Thank you. Uh, Derek or Justine? My name is Justine Golder. I am the training coordinator for the painters, drywall finishers, and glazers. 
My name is Derek Volnix. I'm a representative for Gladers Local 581 and 1075 and the Director of Servicing for our District Council. Awesome. Thank you. Chip? I'm Chip Davis. I'm the Training Director for Plumbers, Pipe Fitters, HVACR, uh, which is uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration um, service techs. So our training center here is, is in here in Cedar Rapids also. Yes, and that's where we usually have construction apprenticeship fairs within that building. Correct. And then Rick. Hi, I'm Rick Beckworth, the Sheet Metal Workers. I'm live from our training center in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Been a union representative for about 15 years, so I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Wonderful. Thank you. Did I miss anybody? Okay, great. So we'll start out with our first question that's coming in. Um, this is from Centerpoint Urbana High School, uh, Steve Spiker's class. So thank you for joining us. Uh, what time of the year do apprenticeship programs begin? I can, uh, so for the carpenters, um, I guess we're all a little bit different. The carpenters, um, it, it depends on the workload of our contractors. We accept applications all year long, every day. Um, and uh, when we have enough new apprentices to start a new class, that's, that's just when we do it. So no specific time, but I know there are uh, other apprenticeships in the area who might speak up and um, have specific timelines for them. We, with the bricklayers, we bring uh, people in as helpers all year long, but then we don't start teaching them how to be a bricklayer until April. We do an eight week pre-job in April, uh, March and April. We start in March. Uh, uh, and then we send them out as first year apprentices the first of The millwrights have orientation every month. Uh, we take uh, pre-apprentices uh, prior to the apprenticeship uh, selection process. And then our selection process, we do it twice a year, once in um, September and once in March. So we take two classes a year into the millwrights. Joey, did you have your hand up? I did. Yeah, we're, we'll take applications all year long. We usually start revising our applications anywhere starting in late January and February, um, but we will run all the way until June, waiting for um, obviously the high school students to get out and we have interest. And then we'll do our final interviews, usually the second week of June. Okay. And then we're full blown after that. Chip? Yeah, um, so plumbers, pipe fitters, HVACRC, uh, HVACR service techs, um, we're, we're kind of the same. Uh, we have a mechanical helper position that we put people into all the time. Um, we take applications year round. Um, we start new apprentices year round based on contractor demand and uh, get them started right away and then just blend into existing classes going on um, as we can make it happen. So we're continuous. Anybody else wanna jump in and kind of answer that question? Um, with, with the sheet metal workers, we, we take applications um, every first Wednesday of every month, uh, except for December. So we also not only take the applications, but um, we hire year round, both apprentices and pre-apprentices positions. Um, don't really interview for pre-apprentice positions. You just have to give us a call and let us know you're interested and we'll, we'll place you. Um, you sort of go through the interview process with the contractor that's hiring you. Um, pretty much uh, the day after our interviews, which would be on a Wednesday afternoon, um, the applicants are 
hired the next day, basically, because there's a big demand right now for apprentices. So things change. You know, it's it's a seasonal work. We, we hire more in the summertime than the winter, but we do hire year round. Okay. Anybody else want to answer that question? So the for two? the the painters, drywall finishers, and glazers, we take applications and hire year round. Um, the only difference is when coming in in the middle of a semester, you would wait until the end of a semester to join our classes. So classes would either start at the end of August or the beginning of January. Thank you. Okay, I think that answers that question. I have a question. Um, what kinds of classes would a student take in high school to really um, put themselves in a position where they are would be a good fit for any of the trades? So I, I can say um, for the carpenters, as well as some of the more technical trades, um, math is, is, is huge. Um, and, and being able to understand that math in a practical application, uh, not just memorizing formulas in a book, but uh, being able to use that math. Um, aside from that, um, we all love people with good attitudes who want to be a team player. Um, you know, if, you, if you're not willing to work in a team atmosphere, then uh, quite honestly, we're probably not willing to look at you. Um, so I, I would say math, um, attitude, and good communication skills, definitely something to look at. Look at. For the millwrights, uh, any welding classes or any type of mechanical class that you can take in high school will uh, give you more points when you go to the selection process. We look at, uh, especially also like John said, math, but any mechanical classes that you can take in high school will help you uh, during the selection process for the millwrights. You know, some schools have, uh, you know, a, a building project that they do, usually they're juniors and seniors. Uh, whether it's going out and building sheds or a garage or a student built home. If you're really interested in the building trades, that might be something you look at or any industrial arts class. Typically you can take wood shop, you know, when you're in middle school, but you know, for sure, I'd, I just tell students that's a good place to start, whether it's uh, wood shop or metals or welding or auto mechanics, anything just to, because number one thing the teacher is going to do is teach you safety rules, how to work with tools safety, how, uh, safely, how to follow directions. And if that's something you enjoy doing, working with your hands and building things, uh, then it's gonna show you, you have a strong aptitude toward our, our building trades. Another thing that might be good to, to get out of uh, the way early is uh, several of the trades require what's called the NCRC, which is a National Career Readiness Certification. Uh, but even if the trade that you're looking at doesn't require that, it might give you a good idea of uh, where you might need to do some extra work. Uh, you know, it, it has all sorts, it has three different areas that it tests. And so it might, it might point out some areas of weakness that you might work on in some of your classes. Okay, anybody else? So I can add a little bit also. Um, we uh, request a copy of your high school transcripts. So we are looking for the industrial art classes, uh, good scores in math and science. Um, you don't have to be the A student, obviously. We're just looking for um, the passing grades. And what we also sort of tend to look at is a person's attendance and tardy levels on their transcripts. So. Um, if there's any questions that come up about that, be prepared to answer those. The glazers, similar to what everybody else said, math, welding, um, possibly even CAD and blueprint reading. Okay. 
Okay, anybody else for that question to answer what types of classes to take in high school? Okay, great. Well, appreciate the answers to those questions. Um, right now, I'm not seeing more questions in the Q&A um, from Centerpoint Urbana. Uh, so I think we'll get started. What we're gonna do now is kind of run through uh, five minute um, sections for people to, um, to just kind of talk about a little bit about their trade. So you kind of hear a little bit about their trade um, like uh, Mike had mentioned, the videos did go out. So hopefully you were able to kind of view some of those videos. Um, but we'll start with um, Rick. Um, are you ready to go with your five minute? Um, sure, I need to uh, do a little screen share. I have a okay. uh, little PowerPoint I put together. So let's see how that works. Here, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Let me put it. Um, so, for us, we're we're a little bit confusing because we're Smart Local Number Two Sixty Three. We are the Sheet Metal Air Rail and Transportation Local. Um, so that means we we only represent sheet metal workers for our local number of two sixty three. But there's Four other sheet metal worker locals in the state of Iowa alone. There's probably there's 200 of them within the U.S. Uh, in Canadian borders. Um, we also represent um, people that work at airports, railroad yards, engineers, and our transportation sector is like bus drivers and subway and trolley people. So. Um, we have a wide variety of people we represent all underneath one umbrella, but uh, we are just a small local here in Cedar Rapids as far as our local number 263. Our uh, sheet metal joint apprenticeship and training facility is right here in Cedar Rapids, uh, 566th Avenue Southwest. Um, it's ran primarily by sheet metal workers. It was built by sheet metal workers, paid for by sheet metal workers. It is a facility solely dedicated just to training sheet metal workers. So our local union office and our training facility are two separate things. So um, here I have just a little video, Let's see if it works. Watch it only a couple of minutes long.
So, so some of the questions that I've answered in the past is, um, you know, the advantage of a sheet metal education, it's, it's a skilled trade that you, uh, you learn and you're always going to be able to have those skills. It's a job. Um, you get job placement and advancement opportunities after you, uh, uh, as you get into the apprenticeship program, uh, there's always a lot of different skill sets that you can train in for different type of opportunities within our trade. Um, current demand for sheet metal workers, like I said, is real high. We're hiring year round. Um, one of the things I really like is it's work that all the trades, you know, when you, you do a project, it's work that you take pride in. Um, I can drive around town still 15, 20 years later and see projects that I, I took part of and I take a little pride in that. And I say, hey, you know, I, I helped put the architectural metal on this or I, I um, did the duct work in this building. So um, there's a lot of pride involved. Um, let me get back to my screen here. share. So as if you look behind me, these are all projects I'm in our training center along with the tin men. These are projects that our apprentices make. This might be a, a, a project that they have to accomplish in um, one class period of time. Uh, we'll do HAVAC work. We do industrial work, which uses different types of metals. Stainless is primarily the metal we use in industrial black iron. So you'll learn welding skills. You know, we, we work on all the different fabrication process. It, it starts out as simple as finding out a pattern to weave a basket. You know, once you learn the fundamentals of uh, basic layouts, you can pretty much fabricate anything in our industry. So that makes it a uh, challenging and um, awarding career, career. So I'm not sure how much time I have left. That was my presentation. Any particular questions for the sheet metal workers? I'll be happy to answer. I don't see any that's come in right now, but if they do, I'll certainly let you know. Okay, thank you. Yes. So um, we'll move along to our next presenter, uh, which will be Justine or Derek? I can go. Okay. Um, for the Glazers, we have a four-year program and you come in about 60% of what a journey person makes for the hourly wage. And then you get a proration on the benefits as well. Uh, you get raised every six months and we do have multiple training centers. We have one in Cedar Rapids, um, or actually, I apologize. Our um, one in Cedar Rapids is actually currently, we're looking for a new one because ours was ruined uh, in Derecho. But we have one in the uh, Quad Cities area down in um, Rock Island, Moline, Davenport area, and also one in Des Moines uh, within Iowa. So I will go ahead and share a, my screen. And I got a short or a little bit of a video as well. So exactly what does a glazer do? An architectural glass and metal technician is called a glazer. A glazer is responsible for selecting, cutting, installing, replacing, and removing all types of glass, engineered materials used in creating the envelope of a building. The creative use of large windows, glass doors, skylights, and sunroom additions make buildings bright, airy, and inviting. Additionally, you could be glazing interior work, creating storefronts, installing decorative handrails, and even installing high-end shower doors. But it doesn't stop there. As a glazer, you would be responsible for work on the glass exteriors of large commercial buildings, replacing storefront windows for establishments such as supermarkets, auto dealerships, or banks. You'll be cutting, grinding, polishing, and using sealants, of course. The handling of sheets of glass in the warehouse and during transportation and installation, using slings and power lift devices like scissor lifts and forklifts. 
promoting the application of green technology, solar technology, and sustainability through the design and installation of energy efficient weatherization materials and solar technology in both residential and commercial applications, working with pre-cut and mounted glass and frames at a factory or a contractor shop, preparing work either inside or outside a building and use scaffolding and elevated lifts for installations, perform administrative tasks such as preparing estimates and invoices, tracking a job, and estimating manpower. As you can see from this long list, glazers perform hundreds of tasks related to glass and many other materials. The kind of knowledge required to perform this job well is as varied as the tools and techniques you will learn to use. You'll need to know the federal, state, and provincial regulations that govern your trade, and undergoing training will keep you and others safe on the job. You'll need to learn project management if you hope to move up to foreman, superintendent, or project manager. You may be dealing with clients on the job, and it always helps to be good at it. Communication is key, and it will be both written and verbal. The more you know, the faster you can progress in your expertise. All right, I know we're limited on time, so I'll go ahead and leave it there so that way uh, Justine has some time for her presentation as well. Okay, so for the painters and drywall finishers, we're pretty close to the same as the glazers. Um, we have a facility in Cedar Rapids as well as Milan, Illinois. Uh, um, we, we start off at about 60%. The, the painters apprenticeship is a three-year program and the drywall finishers program is two years, um, a raise every six months. Um, but yeah, let me share my screen really quick and I will share a video of the painters. I'm sure you know what painters do. Maybe you've even done it. Have you ever helped out painting around the house or perhaps on a summer job? But how do you think the White House stays white or those offices and those skyscrapers get finished? Skilled IUPAT commercial painters, that's how. IUPAT painters are thoroughly trained to be the best and most qualified painting professionals for all commercial projects. Painters apply paint and other decorative finishes to residential, commercial, and other structures. They are able to choose the right paint or finish for the surface to be covered by taking into account durability, ease of handling, method of application, and customer desires. Some IUPAT painting projects require an artistic touch for the restoration of historic buildings, and IUPAT painters are well prepared to handle these and any other painting job. What do commercial painters do? Typically, a commercial painter will be tasked with the final stages of a construction job in places like office buildings, hospitals, and shipping centers. The finishing touches, so to speak. The types of tasks performed by a commercial painter on the job are varied. You may fill cracks, holes, or joints with caulk, putty, plaster, or other fillers. Cover surfaces with drop cloths to protect surfaces during painting. Smooth surfaces using sandpaper, scrapers, brushes, steel wool, or sanding machines. Paint spills, dust from sanding, and other materials must be cleaned and removed from a completed job site. As a commercial painter, you'll paint walls, buildings, and other structural surfaces using brushes, rollers, and spray guns as laid out in the work plan or specification. What kind of knowledge do I need? The kind of knowledge required to perform this job well is as varied as the tools and techniques you will learn to use. You'll need to know the federal, state, and provincial regulations that govern your trade, and undergoing training will keep you and others safe on the job. You'll need to learn project management if you hope to move up to foreman, superintendent, or project manager. Customer service. You may be dealing with clients on the job, and it always helps to be good at it. Communication is key, and it will be both written and verbal. Engineering and technology. The more you know, the faster you can progress in your expertise. The basic skills needed to be a good commercial painter are the same as those that make up a professional tradesperson. You'll need to be effective at listening skills, listening to others, not interrupting and asking the right questions, problem solving, thinking about the pros and cons of different ways to solve a problem. A basic knowledge of math, chemistry, and color theory are crucial to the commercial painter who will need to apply that knowledge and use these skills and applications specific to the painting trade. Of course, the bulk of your job is going to be the handling of paints, solvents, tools, and materials. And to be an excellent commercial painter, you will have to master them. 
Let's look at the physical abilities you'll need to make a good commercial painter. If you have issues with your hand strength or working with hand tools, this may not be the job for you. You must have balance, endurance, and be in good physical condition. You can have no chest complaints or allergies related to paints, solvents, or dust. Excellent vision. You will need to apply paint accurately and make precise visual judgments. Excellent hand-eye coordination. This cannot be stressed enough. If there ever was a trade requiring an eagle eye, it's commercial painting. The ability to solve arithmetic problems quickly and accurately is necessary to be precise and accurate in the use of your tools and materials at every step. Okay. Um, I will stop there because I know we're a little short on time. Great. Thank you, Justine. Great to hear about the painters and glazers. Next, we'll have Daniel Bark with the Millwright. Good morning. Uh, my name is Daniel Bark. I'm uh, with DF Bark Consulting. I'm the full-time recruiter for the Millwright Local. Uh, but I've been 47 years in, uh, in local 2158. Uh, my job as a recruiter is to assist you in any way, any question you have to becoming a union millwright. Um, the, mill, the millwrights uh, cover from Grinnell, Iowa, all the way over to uh, Rockford, Illinois. We have a large local. But I'll talk a little bit more about that after I play my video. Okay, the outline is what is a millwright? The millwrights, we install, level, and align industrial equipment. Any type of equipment that rotates or moves is the work of the millwright to level the line and install. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our millwright local union and our apprenticeship program. Our millwright local union is 2158 and our apprenticeship program is a four year program um, that covers almost every aspect of the apprenticeship program. And after the video, I'll talk a little bit about the next steps to pursuing your career as a union millwright. If you like to work with machines, tools, and high-tech precision equipment, you should think about being a millwright. Come along for the day and see what this high-tech trade is all about. Millwrights are an important trade in the construction industry, working with machinery that requires precision. This machinery is found in manufacturing plants, refineries, food processing facilities, mines, and energy plants. Any industry that has pumps, conveyors, turbines, or extruders needs a millwright to install, level, maintain, and troubleshoot the equipment that keeps production running. If our customer's equipment goes down, it can cost millions of dollars in lost production. Every day is something different for a millwright. Some days I'm installing and aligning new rollers at a paper mill, and the next day I might be using a plasma cutter and fabricating items. The foreman at my company gets me the project assignments and reviews the blueprints so I understand the job ahead of me. You seldom find me at the company's office, but when starting a new job, I select all the tools and materials needed for each job box so it can be delivered to the site. This includes all the power tools and rigging equipment I need. Equipment and tools are a critical part of every millwright's job. My personal toolbox travels with me everywhere I go. I never saw myself working in a cubicle doing the same thing every day. Being able to work in mines, manufacturing, pulp and paper mills, and power plants across the country is exciting. Most people never have the chance to even see the equipment and facilities that I work in every day. Using so many different tools
with precision. Welding equipment and torches are necessary to cut, join, and fasten metal parts together. Millwrights even have a chance to operate some of the larger equipment in plants, and of course, become very skilled in using overhead cranes and hoists to place equipment in just the right place. I learned how to become a millwright by completing an apprenticeship. Apprenticeship is a great way to go to school, learn your profession, and work, earning wages and benefits from day one. The apprenticeship is four years, requiring a combination of classroom, hands-on training, and work hours. The trainers in the apprenticeship center were so helpful in preparing me for millwright work. Whether welding, aligning parts with optics, or calculating rigging capacities, those are all skills I need on a daily basis. I enjoyed the apprenticeship program so much that now I teach a few classes to the apprentices at night. Okay, a little bit of more about our local. Uh, of course, we offer the apprenticeship, but it's free expert training and you earn while you learn. Uh, we have excellent wage potential and benefits. Our journeymen have earning potentials up to $120,000 a year. Our pension contribution is over $14 an hour. So every hour you work, $14 an hour goes into your pension. And our health care is provided by the contractor. So you pay no out of pocket for health care. Uh, more about our apprenticeship. Before the apprenticeship selection, we have what we call the pre-apprentice, where you can work under the supervision of an experienced millwright while you're going through the application process. And once you're selected, our de apprenticeship department offers a four-year program with cutting edge classroom education worth about $120,000 at no cost to you. Also, our apprentices on an average from the first year to the fourth year earn about $50,000 while they are going to school. Uh, our next steps to enter the apprenticeship, you'll request your seat at the next apprenticeship application orientation meeting, uh, which is offered the first Tuesday of most months. You can reserve your seat through my website, DFR Consulting. Uh, guidance, I, it's my job, I'm hired strictly to help you through the application process. Any questions you have, I'm becoming a union millwright. If you go to my website, ask a question, or you can call me, uh, I will assist you all through the process of becoming a union millwright. I've got 47 years in the trade, and that's why I was hired by the millwrights to uh, do nothing but assist in the apprentices through their uh, application process. You'll t attend an application meeting uh, down on our, our office is in Bettendorf, Iowa, because we cover such a wide area. Uh, you'll submit the required documentation and you'll go through the selection process. You'll take a math test and the interview. Now, some of the ways you can get a hold of me, I have a LinkedIn, a website, email, and phone. You can call me anytime, send me an email, go to my website, any way I can help you become a union millwright, that is my job and I look forward to it. And once you're chosen for the apprenticeship, you will become part of the, our brotherhood of local union 2158. And you receive all the training, support, work, and the benefits it has to offer. Thank you. Great, thanks. So much, Daniel, for explaining how to become a millwright. Next, we'll have Joey Pripera with the laborers. Okay, I'm Joey Pripera. I'm the apprenticeship coordinator and the instructor from Labor's Local 43. Our apprenticeship program can range anywhere from two and a half years to four years. Um, 80 hours of training a year is the minimum requirement, 1,000 hours working in the field. Obviously, we are an earn and learn program. Um, as the well-respected trades, um, our program and training isn't as finely detailed and difficult as some of the other trades. Um, 
we do the general math, um, construction math. Pretty much we're a hands-on kind of group. Um, we are like the kind of the jack of all trades. Every one of these trades and the local contractors, laborers um, are with these other tradesmen from your building construction to your heavy highway to the carpenters, obviously millwrights, iron workers. We work hand in hand with everyone. Um, but like I said, it was we're jack of all trades. We work under different contracts. Um, through the construction industry in Eastern Iowa and statewide. Uh, first one we deal with is building construction. That's general construction. So we'll work from everywhere on high rises to concrete construction, traffic control. Um, when we're working alongside the bricklayers, um, we assist with the bricklayers from building their scaffolding, stocking their scaffolding, making their mortar you name it, we do it running their heavy equipment. And we also do demolition on remodels. Uh, next phase of the contracts we work under is the heavy highway. Um, as you've probably seen on television, um, like the Keystone pipeline that was running, that was um, shut down by the uh, Biden administration that consists of operators, laborers, and pipe fitters. Um, we have a big, big play in all of that. Um, pipe laying from the sewer, um, water mains, everything that's outside of the buildings, um, that's usually pertains to laborers and operators. So if you're into stuff like that, that's a big thing. So you see trucks out there like Dave Schmidt, Chick Fry, those consists of, of us. Um, utilities and distribution. So working alongside with the electricians, um, we'll come in and we'll bore out holes and pull out curbs, you know, streets, and then we'll put in lines, utilities, and then the electricians will come in and put their, their lines in through and then do all their fancy electrical work. Uh, working at wastewater treatment plants, um, obviously we pour an excessive amount of concrete. That's kind of our bread and butter for the most part. Um, green, solar, um, solar, we work alongside electricians with that. Uh, wind farms, uh, nuclear power, we're, we're kind of well-rounded um, everywhere we go. <coughs> Excuse me. And then when it comes to environmental, we do asbestos removal, remediation, and also uh, hazard, uh, hazardous waste removal along with lead. So if you like to get your hands dirty and you like to use power tools and you like working from seven to three thirty most of the time. Uh, we're the uh, trade you line to talk to. If you have any questions, you can go to local43.org. Um, our office is at eight one six First Avenue Northwest Cedar Rapids. Uh, my office is Suite B. Come down anytime. Um, look us up online. You can reach me by phone or by email. That's all I got. Great. Thanks so much, Joey. Appreciate that. Uh, Seth, are you um, able to share screen? Are you ready to go? Oh, I'm sorry. We have a question for Joey. Uh, so the question is, do the laborers include equipment operators, trains, lifts, dozers, et cetera? Let me look at that again. We, under certain contracts in certain, we run have rough terrain forklifts and skid loaders only. Anything above that belongs to the operators. Okay. And we train you and certify you for those pieces of equipment. Okay, great. Super helpful. Thank you. Um, so Seth, are you um, able to share screen? Are you ready to go? Um, I'm actually going to have Steve Colson do mine. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Colson. I'm with Ironworkers Local 89. Our training center, uh, our apprenticeship is a three-year program. Most like everybody else's, it's an earn-as-you-learn type of program. We have several different facets to our trade as well. So we're bridge structural, ornamental, and reinforcing iron workers. 
So we pretty much start from the ground and work our way up. Uh, we don't have a video today, but we're gonna kind of do a little tour of our training facility, kind of show you a few different things that we do as well. If you give me just one second here. So our training facility, you can kind of see, I'm kind of doing it on an iPad right now. We have uh, several welding booths. Welding is a big part of our apprenticeship and our trade. So we do multi different processes when it comes to welding, everything from stick to wire to TIG, we cover it all. We have a couple of different CWIs in our program as well that can certify guys. So you will have an AWS certification after you graduate the program as well too. Uh, with Ironwork 2, we have uh, we do a lot of fabrication with as far as iron as well too. So we do not only install it, we fabricate it. Uh, we have a little mezzanine that we have back here in our training facility that was actually built all by apprentices. So all the steel came out as raw steel, meaning it was just the columns, beams, shapes. So our apprentices actually fabricated all the steel, punched all the holes, welded everything to build our mezzanine. Uh, reinforcing, reinforcing, we do uh, any type of reinforcing as far as rebar, post tensioning that you'll find in bridge decks, parking ramps, any of that. We tie place and set all of those. So we have a, uh, mock-ups for our to learn our tie what or to learn our ties in the rebar hopefully i'm not being too jumpy around here and ornamental we build everything as far as doing decorative stairwells mezzanines handrail we fabricate, build, and install all those things as well, too. I know we're kind of short on time, so if anybody's got any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer for them. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that information about becoming an iron worker. Um, I don't see any questions related to that, but if they come in, we'll certainly send them your way. Um, we, um, next up would be, um, John with Carpenters. Yeah. Good morning. <clears throat> so my name is John Delaney and I'm the training coordinator at the Carpenters Apprenticeship. One of the things that attracted me to carpentry, um, when I was starting out was the fact that there's so many facets to it. Uh, I always believed that a carpenter was someone who, framed houses, uh, built furniture, built cabinets, you know, woodworking. Um, but uh, quickly found out there's so much more to it than that. Um, in fact, uh, the area that I fell in love with in carpentry was actually forming concrete. And I love to form um, the walls and stairs and footings and all the things that help uh, support a building anyways. Um, concrete requires a lot of uh, problem solving skills. <clears throat> For instance, on, on your average blueprint of a building, um, it, architects and engineers will design that particular concrete wall, but they never tell us how we're going to build the forms for that wall. That's something that's up to the carpenter to design uh, and build and set in place. But then above that, uh, you might see exterior and interior walls built and uh, in commercial carpentry, um, we're not using just lumber to frame walls anymore. Um, we're using steel studs or metal stud and drywall uh, or gypsum board products, um, as well as we are building scaffold around that building. We are installing ceilings and doing all of the finished work 
like the cabinetry and baseboard and trim uh, that you might think a carpenter normally does. So here at our apprenticeship, we teach uh, all the different facets of the job. Um, and then um, when you're finished with the apprenticeship, we let you decide which avenue you want to become an expert in, um, say concrete forming or uh, interior systems to metal stud and drywall. Um, our apprenticeship is a four-year apprenticeship, whereas one week every three months, we bring our students to class uh, for that full week, uh, 40 hours during the week. And the rest of the time, they're working side by side with very experienced carpenters on the job, uh, teaching um, the hands-on portion of it. So I, I, I see uh, we are out of time, but I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Great, thanks, John. Appreciate that information and overview of the carpenters and how to become a carpenter. Um, right now, I'm not seeing any more questions um, as we're kind of wrapping up, but appreciate everybody's time and Centerpoint Urbana and Steve Spiker's class for joining us. Um, hopefully next year we can meet in person because it's much more fun to see everybody and see the equipment and be able to do kind of hands-on. I mean, this is really what it's about is just um, a lot of hands-on uh, to keep our, our country moving. And boy, uh, if there was anything that uh, kind of showed what a need there is for um, construction and building trades people to get into, it certainly was derecho. I mean, um, we had to have people from all over our country come and help us out because there is such a need for more people to get into the trade. So um, appreciate all of your time and your expertise. Um, like I said, next year, right, we will be together. We will be having um, uh, experiences of just seeing and hearing from you in person. And um, hopefully the schools that are participating can can come again next year. So um, please, if you have not looked at the videos that are within our construction apprenticeship playlist, please check those out. Um, great content in there. If you um, have questions about that, you can go to those videos and might actually answer your questions. Um, we're grateful that you joined us and hopeful for your futures and looking to a career in building and construction trades. So thank you all so very much. Have a good day.